morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where the first story of the day is actually about Beyond the Trailer. I just want to give you guys an update about the next couple of days as I'm going on vacation. It's the 4th of July weekend here in the United States, uh, and a lot of people are going away, and I've decided to make this a non-working vacation. Uh, I hope you'll understand. In the past, I've always uh, had videos ready to go to upload while I'm away, but it's quite taxing on my family to do that. I'm going away with my family, uh, and the result of uploading videos while I'm on vacation is that I'm often, uh, you know, running to the convention center at odd hours, uh, making my family have to wait for me. I mean, I tell them they don't have to, but they're so nice and they do. Uh, or I'm in the corner of the hotel room while everybody else is sleeping, uploading videos like at 11 or 12, uh, you know, a.m., uh, cursing the slow in internet of the hotel being like, doesn't anybody here need to upload a video or do something of some, you know, magnitude? Because I guess, you know, people just do light internet browsing when they're on vacation uh, for the most part. So it's actually a little bit difficult for my family and I just kind of don't want to do that to them this time. Um, so I hope again, as I said, that you understand. I feel bad about it. But I promise you that when I come back on July 10th, the morning of July 10th, programming will reserve, uh, resume and it will be in full force. Uh, I'm really glad everyone likes this channel breakup, uh, the, you know, the three different channels. Uh, if you're not subscribed, there, this one, uh, BTT Movie Math and BTT Disney. Uh, there's programming all set to go for the July 10th date. And, you know, of course, right back in time for uh, Dawn of the Planet of the Apes, which I'm very excited about. Uh, and then there will be no more breaks in coverage for the rest of the summer. Uh, and, of course, coming up is San Diego Comic-Con. I'm very excited about that. And I have some uh, unique coverage coming up, uh, a different way I want to cover it this year. And I'm, I'm pretty excited about it. And I hope that you feel it's as, um, it's as exciting and more effective as I do. But, you know, time will tell. Uh, but also the other thing I want to update you on is that the 2000th episode, uh, so many of you sent in videos, 80 plus videos, and I'm combing through them. I've downloaded all of them. I've begun the edit, but I just have to be honest with you, it's not going to be ready today. I really wanted it to be ready today to play through the whole holiday weekend so everyone could enjoy it, but um, a lot of other things keep coming up. I'm not in charge of my own schedule, unfortunately. When a trailer drops, uh, you know, that just, I have to stop doing everything I'm doing, a big news story. Uh, and so, for instance, today I have a lot of trailer reviews to get up because I want to honor the requests that you guys have coming in. I just am so honored that you have these requests for me for these trailer reviews and I don't want to let you down. And the trailer reviews are, you know, timely. They're, they're dropping now. Uh, so the 2000th episode, I have begun the edit. You guys did such a wonderful job in the videos that you've sent in. I'm so incredibly impressed. Not just with the heart and the cleverness of so many of these videos, but, you know, a lot of the little things that you guys have picked up on that I had no idea that you picked up on. So not only is it fun to watch these uh, videos and quite humbling and, um, you know, really rewarding, but it's really actually very informative to kind of get ideas of, you know, what you like about the show, and I think it'll help me tailor it uh, even more so going forward. So thank you so much again for everybody uh, who turned these episodes in, uh, these videos to, to make this anniversary episode, uh, and I think you'll be very happy with the product when it, it's uploaded, and I really want to make sure, you know, that everybody gets a shot. As I said, 80 plus videos, I think the number's around 87, and I want to make sure every single person is in the video, and that takes, that takes time. It, it's, it's taking longer than I thought, and I really do apologize. But thank you for your patience in this video. I'm going to make it a priority to have it up before Comic-Con, which is, of course, at the end of July. All right, so that's the first story of the day. And I was told for everybody else, I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July weekend as well. And if you're not in the United States, I hope you just have a nice weekend. All right, so let's move on to today's uh, other uh, stories. There are two, and then I have a very interesting viewer question, which I really liked. It was sent to me in a very interesting way over Twitter with like a screen grab photo, I think, of the person's phone, uh, and I, I thought that was it really, really got my attention. All right, so the first, uh, the first um, uh, story story, that you know, legitimate movie news story, is about Enchanted 2. That was announced yesterday. A lot of sequels coming from Disney, you know, uh, The Incredibles, too, that I know some of you said the other day when I said, you know, it's not 100% official. Uh, you said, well, didn't Bob Iger announce The Incredibles 2 and Cars 3 uh, at a company meeting? And it's like, well, he announced them, but I think until we start to see some actual traction and, um, you know, maybe some news stories about it and casting, you know, you just never know how far out these projects are. And I guess the same can be said for Enchanted 2, but they're finally moving forward with it to some degree. So it's kind of actually in the same boat as The Incredibles. Both are very successful properties for Disney, uh, The Incredibles more so because of a little snafu with The Enchanted and Amy Adams and the, uh, the business of having the rights to her likeness, which I'll get to in a moment. But they have uh, gr uh, greenlit Enchanted 2. That means they can start working on it. And they do have a pair of screenwriters. So that's a, a encouraging um, 
sign that this is moving forward. So who did they hire? They hired the screenwriters behind Shrek 2. Now hold on, that's their best credit. Uh, the Smurfs, the first Smurfs movie, which made half a billion dollars worldwide. Uh, and then their live action work includes Are We There Yet? Uh, which actually was, a, that's, uh, that's an Ice Cube movie from a, a while back, actually. It was actually a pretty cute movie. I thought it was very good. Um, not really at the level of an Enchanted, though, uh, in terms of scope. It's much a much smaller film. And they also did Daddy Day Camp, which was, you know, also cute. You know, it was a good way to pass the time. But, you know, you wouldn't be like, who should helm, the, I mean, who should write the sequel to, like, one of the, you know, potentially biggest properties Disney's ever had? I know, these guys. No, I don't, I, I mean, it's a little nerve-wracking. But I do, the only thing that gives me hope is that I think Shrek 2 had a very good script, and it did a very good job. I actually really like Shrek 2. It's my favorite in the Shrek franchise. It did a wonderful job of, um, you know, doing a commentary on fairy tales. What they did with Prince Charming and the Fairy Godmother was just brilliant. Uh, so, you know, you always wonder how much of that is the writer. Uh, someone the other day asked me about screenwriters and why they didn't get more credit. And I think that's because a lot of times the script changes considerably uh, when you get on set. You know, the actors say, well, wouldn't it be great if we improvise this line and the directors have a different idea? Sometimes writers are on set. When I interviewed, for instance, the writers for Red 2, they also wrote Red 1, they're on set to help work out these kind of things that arise. And, you know, not only from, uh, you know, creative uh, uh, requests to change the script, but also sometimes it's a necessity because it's something that pops up during production. Uh, but anyway, that's that's a very uh, nice situation where the writers are on set, but that's often not the case. So who knows who actually came up with those plot points for Shrek 2, but I'm hoping it's these guys so they can apply such wit to Enchanted 2. Now the big question of course is Amy Adams, will she come back? Uh, I probably I would guess no. I think that she feels she's left that part of her career behind. I think she's working very hard to be a more serious actress. She uh, wants that Oscar. She's got a bunch of nominees at this point. I think she's pushing hard for it. And I think that uh, a role in Enchanted would, you know, Enchanted 2 would maybe help her box office resume, but I think would set her back with the Academy. And she's in a hot race with another redhead, uh, Jessica Chastain, and uh, she needs to keep being competitive. She can't take an Enchanted 2 detour. I mean, she did get a Golden Globe nomination for her role in Enchanted, but not an Oscar nom. So I think Amy Adams, you know, she already, I'm sure she already has a lot of money, and I think she's got, she's got Oscar fever, which I'm going to be talking about uh, late next week uh, in, in another context. Uh, but she might actually be another case of somebody who has it. So uh, the other person that might be involved, which is, I think would be fascinating, would be Idina Menzel. And that might be the whole reason this is moving forward. Now, you might recall that Idina Menzel had a supporting role. I believe she played like Amy Adams' best friend or something. She, uh, spoiler, if you haven't seen Enchanted, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not a huge spoiler. I'm sure you can still enjoy so many aspects of the film if you know this. But Idina Menzel is the one who ends up going to the enchanted animated land to marry James Morrison's character. Uh, and of course, Idina Menzel is the voice of Elsa in Frozen. So just like Josh Gad has been getting a lot of work off of Frozen, he did the voice of Olaf. He's getting a lot of live action work. Wouldn't it be nice to see Idina, Idina Menzel perhaps benefit? And this could be a perfect property for her. I think uh, Frozen showed that she has a fan base that is willing to show up to the theater uh, and to see her in person might be just too tempting an offer to pass up. And if they can say it's the voice of uh, Elsa from Frozen, that could be quite phenomenal. Uh, now, of course, the, the, the first film got a lot of Oscar nominations. It's only Oscar nominations. Three, in fact, were for its songs. They were written by Alan, uh, the music by Alan Menken, the lyrics by Stephen Schwartz. But I wouldn't be surprised if they brought the Lopez's in, who, of course, wrote the music for Frozen. Uh, and, and see if they could apply that to Enchanted 2 and put Idina Menzel front and center. That would be a very exciting uh, situation, and it would be a Disney creating a movie star, because Idina Menzel is right now only a Broadway star. I mean, look what John Travolta did with her voice, I mean, her, um, her voice, uh, her, her name, when she sang at the Oscars, because he didn't know who she was. Uh, Idina Menzel is really only in the theater community. Uh, and even after Frozen, I think she still hasn't really been able to break through. Everyone knows who Elsa and Anna are, but they're not quite sure who uh, Idina Menzel is. And I think Kristen Bell, actually, and Jonathan Groff, and even Josh Gad, ended up getting most of the uh, face time and promoting that film. And Idina Menzel, not very much, surprisingly. Which is really unfortunate, because she, of course, is behind the character who is the most popular. But I'm curious to what you guys think. Would you be happy with an Enchanted 2 without Amy Adams that focused on Idina Menzel? And maybe you'd even be disappointed if it went back to Amy Adams and didn't focus on Idina Menzel. Or do you think it's just too late for the entire thing and, and, and Enchanted, uh, you know, it missed its opportunity? Uh, and I, as I mentioned, something about the likeness situation, that's because Amy Adams, the, uh, Disney didn't want to pay her for her likeness, or maybe she was asking too much, or she didn't want to sell it, because uh, she didn't want to have her face plastered on a bunch of merchandise. Also not the best route for a potential... 
uh, Oscar winner, somebody who's being very competitive in that arena. Uh, so Disney really couldn't capitalize on it with merchandising because of that. And of course, merchandising is a key factor in determining which brands Disney is going to move forward with because uh, that's a big part of their revenue stream. That's why uh, Toy Story has so many movies, Winnie the Pooh, Frozen. Uh, these are big brands for Disney. All right, so that's the second story of the day. Now, a movie that I'm very excited about that's coming together is, get this, Hollywood's finally going to make a movie of The Odyssey. That was one of my favorite stories in school. I think it's just absolutely phenomenal. Uh, it's been adapted for a few animated uh, series, I believe, over time. And I think everyone at some point reads Homer's The Odyssey, uh, the story of Odysseus. Uh, and I think it's it's one, it's, I, I'm just a fan of Greek mythology in general, but I think it's just a fantastic, epic story. Uh, I think it's maybe one of those stories that maybe even now that I think of it gets people in to, you know, comic book storytelling, genre storytelling. It really does kind of read like an animated movie or a comic book, but from, you know, ancient Greece. Uh, and it's just an excellent bit of storytelling. Now, of course, it's a poem, uh, but it's very well done. And it doesn't just, it doesn't read like a poem. It's a very, you know, um, cohesive story. And I really actually recommend that you check it out. But Hollywood wants to finally make a movie out of this. I think that's a phenomenal idea. And if it's done well, it could be really a spectacular, um, uh, not only box office, box office performer, but perhaps a movie for the ages. Uh, this is one of those rare stories where when you hear it, you're like, wow, I, I can't believe nobody did it yet. You're right. This is a new and original thing to bring to the screen. So that's very exciting. I hope it turns out better than Troy. Uh, of course, that Brad Pitt movie about the Trojan War with Eric Bana. Uh, that was pretty, I think, I believe that was successful at the box office, but it just, it wasn't like, um, you know, the Roman sandal epics of old. Ben, uh, ben Hur, Spartacus, all fantastic movies that I actually recommend that you check out as well if you're looking for something to watch this weekend. Uh, those are some great movies that came out of Hollywood, and I, I would, of course, love to see the Odyssey on that level. So who did they hire to direct this movie? This story just gets more interesting. Well, the person they hired uh, is Fedor Bondar Bondarchuk. Bondarchuk. Sorry about this. He's Russian. Fedor Bondarchuk. Uh, and he is a, a Russian director. I believe he's actually the son of somebody who's successful in uh, the Russian entertainment business. He is an actor, a producer, and apparently an on-air host over there. And he's not only big in Russia, but apparently he's also very popular as a director in China. So, of course, you know, ding, 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 Hollywood here is, you know, the, that's the Pavlovian response. They'll have lots of money coming their way. So by hiring this director, not only do they potentially have a big box office to turn in the United States, but also in China and Russia, which are huge box office performers at this point especially China, um, because with Transformers, Transformers Age of Extinction performed very well in both of those countries. It was the second biggest opening ever for Russia, with 80% of their business there done in 3D theaters, so that's phenomenal. Uh, and then in China, Transformers 4 Age of Extinction opened with 90 million, the biggest opening ever for that country, period, for any movie at any time. And that's only 10 million behind the U.S. is open, or 7 million behind the U.S. is open, if you want to believe the rest of Hollywood versus Paramount. But still, that's such a close opening that China, you know, China, the, the people in the entertainment industry there are saying they I feel China will uh, soon surpass the United States as a uh, box office revenue earner for films in Hollywood, uh, and that seems to be happening sooner rather than later. I mean, they are awfully close even now, right now. So you could be seeing this happen maybe in the next year or so, and that's really going to vastly change the kinds of movies that Hollywood is making and the talent they're going to utilize. It's a very exciting and interesting time for the movie business. I think we haven't seen this kind of change uh, since, you know, like they put in sound and color and computer animation. I mean, it's that big of a change in terms of a more global aspect to the business. Uh, so, but this is the reason they hired him, besides his fandom. Why is he so popular in Russia and China, or well, in Russia in particular? It's because he directed that movie Stalingrad. You might have remembered I mentioned this uh, recently, a couple months ago, and that's an extremely successful movie in Russia. Now, I actually watched it because it's all, it was available on demand about a month ago. It might still be available on demand, and I thought it was pretty darn good. It wasn't great. I think the story was a little, uh, you know, the structure was a little too loose for me, uh, but I think that it worked, and I, I did bring me in, and I thought it had some amazing set pieces, particularly at the beginning of the film. Uh, really impressive visuals. You know, a lot of you were talking these days about lack of um, risk that Hollywood is taking creatively, and this guy, I think, took some risks with this movie. Uh, so I, I, um, I think that was great. But as I said with my review of Snowpiercer, well, actually, in the comment section, you cannot applaud a movie on ambition alone. And I think that this director delivered more so than Snowpiercer, uh, but he still fell a little short, and I hope he has a better screenwriter this time around. But the reason that the studios in Hollywood like him so much is that he made Stalingrad for just... 30 million and used no green screen. And if you've seen the film or if you do see it, you will understand how amazing that fact is because it looks great. 
It looks very believable for this big war movie and it has some very big set pieces. So to achieve all that for just 30 million, I don't know what the price points are in Russia though. I mean, things might be more expensive here, talent, uh, you know, crew, uh, who knows what the differences might be. But still, to get such a, pro uh, a product for that little money is quite uh, impressive. And so it shows that he's really very savvy with a, a small budget. So imagine what he can do if Hollywood gives him just a slightly bigger one. If they can bring in the Odyssey for under 100 million in terms of the budget, that would be phenomenal. Because remember, most big blockbusters today have budgets of north of 150, sometimes often closer to 200. I mean, that's why Edge of Tomorrow is uh, suffering so much in such a clunker uh, financially, because it's being weighed down by a 178 or 80, 180 million dollar budget, which is just insane. Uh, and look at, you know, if you look at the difference between uh, Edge of Tomorrow and Stalingrad, it's not that big in terms of epicness. So that's, that's really, you know, hats off to this Fedor guy. He, he's a, he's a very savvy filmmaker. So that's very exciting. I can't, I'm very curious about this and I will definitely be keeping an eye on it. So let's get to today's viewer question. The, the, um, the, the screen grab of, I think it looks like a phone cover uh, that was tweeted to me. And the, uh, um, it comes from, oh, let's see. Oh, I don't have the name. Uh, I'm sorry about that because I just grabbed the picture. Uh, but the tweet goes, Hi, I'm a massive fan from England. Awesome. Uh, me and my brother watch your episodes every evening before tea. I love that fact. I loved it so much. As I said just the other day, I love hearing you how, how you guys watch these shows. Uh, it really, you know, gives me a great picture of how, you know, how you enjoy it, how it adds to your day. And as I said, that can help me tailor the episodes to that. And uh, that was just, you painted such a lovely picture. Uh, I was really, I just loved it so much. And I love that you have it before tea. That's so great. I love uh, English tea. As I often say, I love English toast. And by the way, if you're wondering, someone said, what's the difference between English toast and American toast? Well, English toast is just, uh, it's a really good quality bread for some reason. And it's, um, you can, you can have it in America, but it's like a certain way it has to be prepared and it's just lightly toasted just so it's warm and a little goldeny and crunchy and so delicious and then you have just a little bit of butter on it and it's just so good it's amazing like in America they, they tend to have like really dark toast this is just like kissed by the toaster and it's so good so next time you make toast consider making it the English way and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised so on to this question it says your channel is our favorite um, and that's just, I, and I really appreciate you saying that. I uh, hope this question fits in with the stories today. I made it fit in! <laughs> Korra is going amazingly as a TV show. Of course, he's talking about The Legend of Korra. But I was wondering if The Last Airbender, and here he's referring to the M. Night Shyamalan film, has ruined the property so much that nobody ever will risk making a Korra movie. I feel that the storyline is less complicated and more suited for a movie adaptation than the original Avatar series. He's talking Korra versus the first Last Airbender um, three seasons. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, and then uh, this, this person adds, Caitlin Stacy would be an epic actor for Cora. Uh, excellent. First, th another reason I actually picked this question is I wanted to bring up the fact that I haven't done any Legend of Cora reviews. That's also because of a timing issue, trying to get ready to go on vacation, getting these other episodes up, and the fact they dropped three. Uh, and that made it very difficult to cover uh, with everything else that needed to get out. So I think that I'm, go I, you know, I'm really struggling with trying to, you know, uh, that's one of the reasons I wanted to leave Think About the Ink Behind. It's just, you know, I don't like disappointing you guys. Uh, but I, you know, I've gotten so many requests about these reviews for Cora that I'm going to try and do it when I get back. And then when Cora, I believe it begins like July 13th, maybe, or something, uh, when it begins in earnest and they just show one episode a week, that might be a little bit easier for me to review. I'm going to try really hard, but I just wanted you to know what was going on there. And I don't want you to think that I haven't seen your request. I have. So as for the question here, I've talked often about the, thing, the fact that I think this would make a great movie property. I do feel The Last Airbender has heard it. I think Hollywood is very big at looking at past performance, and I think they're going to see that that movie was a real clunker, and that it really disappointed a lot of people, and the fan reaction was just horrible. And I would say that, you know, if they would just take a moment and think about it, and I hope somebody brings this up, the reason that that, that wasn't successful, that adaptation, is that it tried to, like, squeeze a whole season into two hours, and that's just impossible. And I think that if they were to make a Legend of Korra, or any kind of adaptation, Avatar film. They sh and this, I'm of course talking about the Nickelodeon series here. There's, there's this confusion because James Cameron has, you know, like co opted the term Avatar. Uh, I mean, of course, nobody here of any of these parties created it, but still, um, you, know, you know, the Nickelodeon people used it first. Uh, but I think they shouldn't do an adaptation. They should do an original standalone story that's written directly for the screen. It would get more people to go because you can only see this story if you saw it in theaters. And I think then they could work within the time limits instead of trying to smash uh, a really beautifully detailed, nuanced uh, season. In into just this two hour you know, time span, or three hours if you really wanted to make a run for it, but I just feel it's not uh, productive. And I also would not, 
maybe I potentially wouldn't do any of the act the characters that currently exist. Make a whole other group of people. Because I love the voice work. Uh, I believe the actress's name is Lynn Varney, who does Cora on the show. She's great, and I wouldn't want to replace her with another actress. Uh, so I would really like to just see a whole new group of actors that could create something special, unique for the screen. And where you have the crossover is behind the camera. Use that talent uh, that I think is are clearly working on uh, the scope and scale of film already, uh, with how much quality they put into these episodes, and just let them make a standalone movie. It's like, you know, a spin-off graphic novel or something. Go and do that. I mean, the Avatar universe is clearly very big at this point, just like they did with the first Avatar, you know, that flashback uh, episode or episodes where they talked about the, the story of the first Avatar and how that came to be. Uh, and I thought that was just phenomenally well done. And you could easily do that as a movie or something like that, some kind of story like that. Maybe, you know, a, histo a history of a certain the Fire Nation or something you could do. Who knows? I would just, I would really like to see that instead. I hope that someday somebody does make a Korra movie. I'm a little torn if I want to see it live action or animated. I think you could go either way. Um, I think it would be, I think it's the best property to maybe bring in uh, an animated film at the level of they are in, uh, overseas in Asia, where they have a lot of animated action films that uh, adults go and see. I still think that animation is largely family fare here in the U.S., and I think if any property could kind of push it in that direction into more, uh, more of a genre-y area, it would be The Legend of Korra. And that would be very exciting in and of itself. But we'll see. I mean, Avatar has become so popular, you know, trends on Twitter, uh, but I, and Nickelodeon continues to undercut it. For instance, nobody, they didn't really promote that they were airing these three episodes last week, uh, last Sunday. Uh, and, and I think that this property could be a Game of Thrones level uh, success for them if they were to promote it as well as HBO promotes Game of Thrones. And of course, there's talk of a Game of Thrones movie. So why not a Legend of Korra movie? So thank you so much for your question. Enjoy your tea after this episode. Uh, and thank you everybody for tuning in. I hope you have a wonderful 4th of July holiday. Uh, and again, if you're not in the United States, I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, and there will be a lot of content going up today, so you can watch it today. You can save a, a few episodes for uh, over the next few days when I won't be here. Uh, but I'm excited to see you back on July 10th. And also, you know, send me tweets. I will be checking stuff like that. I'll try and tweet while I'm on vacation. I will do that. Send me Facebook messages of stuff that you want to make sure I cover when I get back. Uh, because Thursday and Friday will be big catch-up days for any trailers that might have dropped or any stories to just get that out there. Because, um, as I said, I'll be back with a vengeance after taking a short break. All right, thank you so much for tuning in and have a wonderful day. Um, and as I said, great, uh, great holiday or just great weekend.